Do you have a minute for Comadre time? Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have an amazing guest. Her name is Tiffany, and I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hey, I'm Tiffany, uh, the voice behind Fidgets and Fries. Um, I'm an autistic mom, storyteller, uh, advocate. Um, I have two boys with autism as well. Um, yeah, they're both teenagers and, um, I basically just share a bunch of stories to, um, challenge people's, uh, perception of autism and, um, discuss the intersections of race and disability and, um, take people to the edge of their comfort zone and give them what they need to push themselves over the edge. Love <laughs> it. I love me some disruptors. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I started following Tiffany um, because her book, I forgot who posted your book. Somebody posted your book and then I started following your account and I was like, oh my God, I would love to have this book. So then it's coming out in May, 2023, you guys, in a couple of months. And you can pre-order it now, but the book is beautiful. Um, the name of the, the title of the book is A Day Without Words, and it reminds me a lot. I haven't read it yet, but it reminds me a lot of the the reason why I jumped that book by the Japanese um, young man that wrote about his experience being nonverbal. But um, I love Tiffany's book because it's a different perspective because she's also She's one of the characters in the book, and her son is in it as well. So, um, before we get into the meat and potatoes, um, today's topic is navigating neurodiverse parenthood. And the reason why the topic came up is that as parents of neurodiverse children, we often wonder what their futures are going to be like. And Tiffany, I feel like, is a great example of how she was able to use her disability and continue to soar. And help her sons in the future, like now, um, to be more well adapted to the world. And also, she it helped her become a more fierce advocate for her children, which I love. So, um, you told us that your children have both have autism. So, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Like, um, I don't want to say levels because I feel like our sons, when our sons were diagnosed, they weren't, there were no levels, right? It was like Asperger's or, yeah. or whatever because they're older. My son's yeah. 14 as like, you know, I think a little bit younger than yours. But, um, yeah, so t- tell us more about what that was like and um, kind of hey. walk us through it a little bit. That was, um, that was a, was like a challenge in time. It was, um, Aiden, he doesn't have a level. Um, but Jojo, when he was diagnosed, he had a level. He got a level. Um, he was diagnosed at six, and, um, he's 13 now. And, um, uh, Aiden was diagnosed at 17 months, and he's 15. Um, so he didn't have levels. And he, his diagnosis was pretty, um, it was pretty straightforward, pretty just like, this is what it is. I think he went into, uh, well, actually, we was watching a uh, TV one day, and this was, like, around the time when they were showing, like, Autism Speaks commercials, like, all the time, like, or, like, um, around the clock, and I think it was, like, one in 250 at the time or something like that, and, uh, my mom was like, hey, what you gotta get, you should get him looked at, you know, because he wasn't speaking then, um, he was like, 13, 14 months. And I was like, still not speaking, still not trying to like connect with anyone. And he's our first baby, so we're like, we don't know what's good and what's, you know, what's to be concerning and stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, it took us about a month to get in with um, ECI. And then that's early childhood um, intervention. And then it took couple of my months to get in with uh to see a developmental pediatrician which we kind of looked up because they said the wait list was like a year long 
someone canceled or something, and that's great. We was able to uh, get it early. He was diagnosed like pretty quick with with him, um, and then he had a appointment with the state as well. So they kind of like linked up kind of like at the same time because mm-hmm. we were supposed to do the, the one with the state first and then wait like that whole year before we got in to see the um, developmental uh, pediatrician. So he was diagnosed with a, a clinical psychologist um, with the state and she just took like two seconds to look this at him and then she was just like autism. <laughs> I was like, okay. Oh. Um, and then afterwards came the like paperwork and stuff and like asking the questions and stuff but just from like seeing him observing the behavior yeah and how he was um behaving in the office and and things so we got that uh diagnosis and that was kind of that was really rough i just like like, dang okay um it was wild jojo's was um in a lot of ways harder i guess um because I pretty much knew he was um, when he was like three, and he talked, and he and he um, would interact with us, and and he would talk. But at school, he talked to no one. He didn't like connect with anyone. He had some behaviors that uh, were different than all the other uh, kids and things, and then. The doctors would tell me, let's just wait and see. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. And so I waited and I put it out for like three years. And then I was just like, it got like, I don't want to say worse, but it got more concerning. And over that three year period, and I was like, he could have been having help um, in those three years. So and then he was diagnosed. Yeah. His was like a lot harder. Because he's like me, and so, like, you feel like you know more of what he's, like, going through. Like, so you feel you have that same type of feelings and mm-hmm. stuff. And, and I know, like, at one time he was in school, and he was still in school, and he came home and he said, he asked me um, if something was wrong with him. And I was like, no, like, why did he ask that? And he said, because no one wants to play with me, or no one wants to be with me. and I was like, because that's around the time you, you know, um, you notice that the kids treat you differently. And that was around the time and I was like, nah, we just, we have to, we have to do something to help him. And that, and that starts with understanding who he is and, and, um, if he has any diagnoses, we have to find out what it is that we can help him with and not just so he can like have friends and stuff just so he can understand himself and 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 you know know that something's not wrong with him this is just he's just different yeah and that's who he is and yeah but those those journeys was was like hard in like the beginning because it's just I'm, like you're telling me about jojo's journey and i was getting teary-eyed because like you know it's hard Especially as a kid, like you don't understand. And then kids can be so freaking mean. Like I'm a school teacher, so I see this all the time. Some kids can be so mean because the parents don't teach them empathy or to like tolerate differences. Not tolerate, but accept differences that everybody's not going to be exactly like you. And that's okay. You know, so it, it like really breaks my heart when um kids are like that. And, and the fact that Jojo had to go through that is BS. I, you know, that yeah. doctor sucks. And I hope they provoke its license. Because <laughs> that's another thing. I feel like in communities of color, they take so long and they give us so much pushback to get our kids actually diagnosed, which is wild to me. Because you're seeing it, I'm seeing it, but then they're like, no, you know, let's give them time. Right. My son lost all his words. Um, I want to say, Tiffany, he was, uh, he was speaking. He had about 25 to 30 words. And then all of a sudden, at around 16 to 17 months, he lost all his words. He only had uh, milk in Spanish and mommy. And that's it. So then the, um, I didn't really notice until I saw an increase in aggressive behaviors because he was getting frustrated because he couldn't communicate with me. 
you know. And then when I brought it up to the pediatrician's uh, uh, attention, she's like, no, that happens. I was like, that does not happen. I was like, I studied developmental psychology when I was becoming a teacher. That does not happen. I've been around kids my whole life. That doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And and she was like, oh, okay, we'll just send them in. I was like, regardless if you send them in or not, like, what what are they going to say? If, if there's nothing wrong, they're just going to say, okay, there's nothing wrong. But if there is something different, then he needs to get the, the services that he needs, you know? Right. They don't listen. They don't care. And um, you have to check off, like, a lot of boxes for them to even take you serious like and it just sucks it's like it shouldn't be this difficult it shouldn't be this challenging it shouldn't be this um hard for us to 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 access um proper care and and a diagnosis and all of that and then they they misdiagnosis a lot they diagnose us later and they misdiagnose us i've seen that and, a lot um, and it's and it's and it's frustrating it really and, is. And, it, and it and it and it hurts and it's just like like come on like, like what's what's going on what are we doing and that's a lot of stuff that i try to like talk about and and, and been trying to talk about since I started sharing on social media and, and and it was hard in the beginning and honestly it's still hard but less hard so like if it was like on a scale of hardness and it was like 10 that's how uh-huh. it was, what it was when yeah. I started now it's like at like a 7 <laughs> like it's still yeah, hard a little but, less hard but still but hard like, less. yeah cause you, you just get they find new ways to frustrate you it's like you you get over one thing and then they come up with something else. <laughs> like, it's all different. And you're just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, so like, this is just another thing that we have to talk about. Another thing that we have to address. Another thing. And and it feels like never ending. Okay. So you said your mom was the one that suggested for um, Aiden to get the, um, an evaluation. Uh, how was the support from the rest of your family? Or friends, or people that you hold close to you. It was cool. I don't want to say cool. It was. It was expected. Like it was. Um. Because he was more quote unquote obvious. Yeah. Like here he is. He's almost two, and he doesn't talk, and he doesn't like stare at you or look at you, or he's um not playing with other kids and he's not you know he has like these behaviors that um uh people think are weird and odd and like to them it was it was it felt obvious even if they didn't know what autism was um it felt obvious to them that he had something Mm -hmm. so that was a little bit um easier for their them to to get him and stuff. I wouldn't say they fully understood it, but they easier for them to like get. Jojo was more difficult because he, he talked. He talked to them and he uh he would interact with them. Um so he was a little bit harder in the beginning. It was more like, oh he's not he's not he doesn't have this. He doesn't have, you know, autism he's talking to me or he's this and so he that was a like harder to explain to people yeah and it was just at, at that point I'm like i just got tired of explaining it and i didn't feel like like doing it <laughs> like and especially like i already got to do it with with people i i don't know with strangers and things like that i'm not gonna do that with family like I'm tired and i don't feel like talking about it and, mm-hmm. and like I'm just like so I just stopped addressing it explaining it whatever you can either get on board with this or you know or don't but I don't care and cause you know I just it's they're not here like taking care of him mm-hmm. 
And that's all on on me and my husband. And it's just like life right now is complicated and, and, and hard as is. It's like I can't keep I can't give like my energy to these people. Mm-hmm. Like that's true. So that wasn't easy though. I make it seem like it, it just came up, it popped up easily. Like, like it was like <laughs> two weeks and I figured it out. Nah, it was more like two two years probably before, you know, you figure out that, you know, you just need to stop. You know, it's just they don't feel what they feel and they'll come around. You know. Did you did you feel because I felt like at one point there were some people not my not my close friends. But there was people in my family that kind of like distanced themselves because they didn't understand what the diagnosis meant and or why he would react in certain ways to certain things. So um I found that we started getting involved, invited less and less. Was that something you experienced or was it a little bit different for you? Yeah, it was similar. Invited less um, to things or like they would watch their cousins more, like, you know, sleepovers and mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and they wouldn't really like watch our boys, um, things like that. We kind of like you picked up on that. It was um, very sucky, <laughs> like in the yeah. in and it says we had like like my grandma. She was really good. She was um, she watched them when she could. I mean, but she was like probably like like the only one really who could mm-hmm. or did or um anything like that. My mom couldn't really like do it. She's like she has MS, so it was a lot of like mm, okay. Health complications. You know, they run. Yeah, like, you know, she can't yeah. go get them and, and things like that. So, but yeah, we noticed that um, a lot. But it was like a mixed uh, bag. It was like, on one oh, hand, you get invited yeah. less by certain family members. And then, like, other ones, it's like, because you were treated a certain way by some then you kind of like apply that to all of them and then you, you didn't invite yourself to things like you just oh, stayed away yeah. like you just didn't want to go and then like they would ask you know hey how come you didn't come or you didn't come or not and then was like okay we'll brave it and we'll go and then they was really cool about you know the, the kids there like you know Aiden <laughs> running around and bouncing around and you know sometimes you might break something and <laughs> and they were really cool about it and 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 things like that so that you know, that helped, and then you have someone not be <laughs> like, so it was just trying to, like, figure out which ones were <laughs> okay, and yeah. which ones weren't, and then, um, but for the most part, everyone's everyone's good now. Yeah. Everyone's So tell me, tell the audience, because I already follow your account, but tell the audience a little bit more about Aiden and Jojo, like, what are their personalities like? What kind of stuff are they into? Like, what makes them sparkle? Like, you know, I know one of them likes to cook, I don't, but I can't remember if it's Jojo or Ada. Oh, that's Jojo. Okay. Jojo's a chef. <laughs> he's like, a, he gets into something and then he like he goes all the way in. So he loves to like cook things and like create things and and all of that. And he he's like his dad, and they they watch the cooking videos to oh yeah yeah like to, to know how to do it and then i'm over here all frustrated and stuff because i I just need to read it i can't watch somebody do it <laughs> i just need to print it so i can read it and after those but they need to they're like a visual very very visual yeah so visual, learned, visual and then they have to do while they're watching right so yeah yeah he'll he'll watch something and sometimes he'll watch it all the way through they kind of gets like an idea, uh-huh. and then when he gets started, he doesn't have to like stop it as much or, or, okay. or things like that. But he still has to watch it. And I'm like, just print one, <laughs> like just print something, <laughs> like so we can like go do it. Like, no, you just want to watch it and go. So, but he he's our chef. He cooks like everything. He did like um last year. Well, not last year because it's the brand new year. Oh, right. No, I'm confused. It's like early January. So I'm gonna say last. I meant the year before. He did a um, he did a beef Wellington <laughs> for uh, 
Thanksgiving. Well, excuse me, Mr. Fancy. I can't even make this. It was so good. And then, like, the following, I think, on the next holiday or so, it might have been, like, two years ago. On the next holiday, we did a vegan beef wellington because we were doing vegan oh, for a yeah. while and stuff. So that one was actually pretty good, too. But he makes breads and, and he makes pastas, like homemade pastas. And, wow. Um, he, uh, he grills and he barbecues and all that stuff. Like, he just... He likes to do those things and create things. And now he's he's stuck on art right now, so he's doing a lot of drawing. Nice. Um, uh, a lot of uh, comic comic book comic strips. Right yeah. So like he's studying the um, drawing styles of his favorite comic book artist and um, blending them together and and and. and creating this different types of styles of his favorite comic book characters. So he's he's doing that right now. But he is um he's very, 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 very intelligent. <laughs> like like just like wild. It's like he has a fact for everything you say. Like you don't even know where it comes from. Like you're like, huh, I don't know about this almond butter and then he'll be like you know almond butter was created and yada 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 yada, yada. <laughs> and i'm just sitting like what <laughs> like are you talking about this you know or like something like he just like has a i'm like where are we learning this stuff at like well how do you have a fact for everything listen, we're talking they, about they like research or they listen uh, yeah and they just absorb just, things and you're just like what like yeah. where did you get it from it's it's all amazing he's like a walking like encyclopedia or something. <laughs> like, he's into that stuff he's always like learning and, and teaching himself different things and um Aiden he's he's like the perfect mixture of myself and dad <laughs> like like he's very like mellow and like chill and, and things like that even though he's loud like he's, he, he makes he grunts a lot and stuff but He's still so, like, chill. Like, his dad. And, like, nothing really, like, bothers him. Like, you know, he kind of just lets it kind of, you know, roll off and off his back. And he's just very, you know, he's generally happy, like, all the time. And and he doesn't smile much, but you know he's happy. And um, he, uh, he loves his fries and he... I read that you guys have like a fry off, and he and he likes to. Oh yeah. Taste everybody's fries and everybody's like, fries, and, and he yeah. gives them the prize of like who has the best fries. Yeah, because he because he doesn't because he doesn't talk, so we're just like, how do we know whose fries won? And so we're like, we'll just judge off of like whose plate he finished. So, <laughs> so how do you how do you how do you how does jo- Jojo decide on who won the fry contest? Um. Oh, you mean Aiden? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, he, whoever's play he finishes. Oh. He's very, <laughs> like, that's one thing. Like, he's very particular about fries. He loves fries, but he won't eat the ones he doesn't like, like, at all. Oh, so okay. he'll just, like, so we're kind of like, whose fries is he going to eat? And then if they finish them, if he finishes them, that's the winner. You know, so we kind of just sit back and then see who won. I mean, see whose fries he finishes and then whose fries he wants more of. And I'm like, that's the winner. And we do it once a year. On his that's birthday. awesome. And that's when we do all three of us doing it. But then like, we make like homemade fries throughout the year. Like just one of us. Or something. Aiden's First favorite thing. cut is like, I think, um, like the shoestring fry. Don't talk to him about no, none of those um, spirally ones or the crinkle <laughs> cut. You know, like, you want to know. No. He, that and the potato wedges. He's okay with potato wedges. But besides that, he's like very, he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, you know, you have to. Like the, the his, Aiden's most favorite fries are McDonald's. If they're like, they have to be fresh. If they're frozen, they have to be all right period. Okay. And then he's not the biggest fan of their shoestring ones, but he'll eat them if he has to, like last minute. He likes their crinkle cuts more if they're frozen. Oh. Um, and then you can't get them with a steak fry, whatever. I think it's just too much potato <laughs> or something. Yeah, or something. It's, it's just dry. Like, 
it's like, like yeah, it's like, it's, like it's, it sticks to you on the way down. And I don't think that's a. It's not a favorite of his. He's not <laughs> a fan, but so, he's awesome. So he sounds like a great kid. Um, I was gonna ask you. So when have they set him up with a um a communication device to communicate with you guys, or like a pike system, or or something he like that? He was doing when he first started speech therapy. They introduced um, protocol, um, protocol to go to him, and he was mm-hmm. like three or four. And then they decided that it was too much for him; like he couldn't do it. And so they went back to doing it, teaching it, and then they went to PEX. And at the time, anything on them because you don't really know. And then he realized PEX wasn't that good for him. It was just. It was like they choose what you're choosing between, and then you're like choosing it for like some type of reward, and then it was just so it didn't really help. And um, over the years, it was I'm I was printing out the the images and the and the core boards and all that stuff. Like I couldn't afford um like any of the devices and stuff, so I was just trying to like make books myself. And then, you know, like, you know, Board Maker, the ones who make all the the little Girl, images. We had, we had free access to that when I worked yeah. at District 75 back in the day. But now, like, when they changed their system over to, like, digital, like, now you have to, like, pay for it again. And it, it was just frustrating. So I, like, stopped using Board Maker because of that. And I, like, use my own visuals that I, that I make, like, um the social stories with. But Board Maker is amazing. Yeah, I wanted it. I couldn't get it, but I learned that you can get um back when I was trying to do it. You can get um a free month trial. So like I used my little email, I got the free month trial and I printed everything that I could in thirty yeah, days. I good. I ran through saved and print. Then you're like, I'm cutting it, I'm putting it into these these binders with these like dividers and the mm-hmm. velcro and the things so he can go and pick the things once. And then I realized you know, he was going through and he was flipping through the pages to find the things that he wanted. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't just grabbing like cup and then like here, cup, you know, give it to you. He was doing like cup, ice, straw, juice. Oh my god. Like things yeah. like that. So I'm like, I'm telling the therapist, I'm like, I think he's ready, can we try? Not they was just not on board with it at all. And I was just like, man, this is wild. Then Autism Speaks came out with a, um, I don't know if it's a program or a thing. You can apply to get a, it felt like a contest, but I don't know how to describe those things. But you apply, and they only had 25 um, iPads that they would give to. So you you apply. And you, so you kind of like them. a scholarship in a way. Yeah. And that always felt weird to me when you think about it. I was like this big giant organization you only have twenty five iPads to give away. But um I have my own opinions about autism speaks when I So that was that like <laughs> So yeah. It was just it was wild. Yeah, I have my my thoughts of them. I'm not like I'm trying to I'm not like deep in the hate, you know. So it's just No, like, I don't just, I don't hate I don't, them, it's just I feel just, like certain things need like, to change. Yeah, I feel that way. I feel that way. But they helped me get a lot of resources that they're i used to just go to their walks for the resources mm. and because they have nice resource fairs like yeah. everybody that's in the area would be there like all the speech therapists booths would be there and ot's would be there and um some physical therapists and and and, and that's how we learned about different programs to sign up for like we sign up for hip which i would have never learned anything about which is basically a program where if your child receives medicaid but he, they also have commercial insurance or something like through their through mm-hmm, their dad's mm-hmm. job. They will reimburse you what your employ what you're paying in your employer insurance. So like oh. whatever whatever comes out of like my husband's check for our Blue Cross Blue Shield, they pay it back to us. Ooh, and so, okay. And I would have never known that if I didn't go to the. <laughs> I I want to say they said that I don't want to say every state has this program, but I think they said most do. Type of program. It might not be called HIP. In other states, um, you but know, every state has they will always else. name it something else, and you're just like, what? Yeah, <laughs> have, like a standard. Like, yeah, just like 
label it all across the board, guys. Like when I, we I, said, we have Medicaid service coordination, which is like you know the Medicaid waiver program. So with that one, you go in and you can get um, respite, uh, calm have, and all these other services. But then every other state has a different name for it. And then like, let's say you move to another state, how are you gonna know? You're not gonna know. Nobody's gonna be like, hey, you have autism. Let me come and give you some resources. It's like you have to dig really hard, and then sometimes you don't even find the resources that you need. Exactly, and that's 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 a lot of the um, problems that we we have, like, even within your own state. When you move from place to place to place to place, you mm-hmm. don't know everything. You don't know what's all here and what's there, and you know what happens and what doesn't happen, and and it's just like. Even the the Medicaid type um, insurances that the kids do have because of their disability, mm-hmm. even that's different from sta- from area to area. Like yeah. in one area, it's ran by like a mayor group, and then I move to a different area, a mayor group's not there, so I got to get Superior, and then okay. so but then they have different benefits on there, and then this one has different, benefits. and so you're just all these things you're trying to learn and and, and do, and you're just like. Why is this not the same? It's in the same state. It's in the same thing. What are we doing? And and so it's just like it's a lot. And and it's a um, work. like yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. Always, all the time. Um, they sent me a notice from his insurance saying like, starting January two thousand twenty three, he's gonna be able to get ABA. So now I gotta find the ABA place, which I'm glad. I feel like he needs a little bit of it. Um. But we're going to get into that a little bit later because I know you have your opinions about that and I love the, you know, how transparent you are about it. We can like touch on it and then we can refer them to your book too because if you have a book, people can read the book. But um, I wanted to ask you, what are some of your fears or reservations as a parent of children who will young, one day be young adults? Well, they're already on their way to being young men um, who are men of color. And are also on the spectrum. Jeez. That's heavy. It's, uh... I don't know. I think that the, I think the, the closer they get um, to adulthood is, um... We have more fears than, um, than like, anything else. Like, when they're younger and stuff, it's, um... You thought about it, but it wasn't, like, it didn't feel immediate. Not that and they're still then, cute and people are yeah. you know, okay with it. But then as yeah. they get older... And you know, being seen as a threat. Yeah, and you and you know it. You feel it, you know, in the back of your head. Like right? it's not right there. Like when you're three and they're, and they're four, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, you know, if I don't get them here to at this point, you know, but I still have time. And then this, and then, but then next thing you know, boom, they're like fifteen already, and you're like, I'm running. You feel like you're running out of time. Like, my knees is achy and wobbly. You know, I don't know how long I can, like, do things. <laughs> so I can't do stairs, right? I got all these chronic pains and, and things. And and now you're, like, staring down, like, guardianship for one and then trying to figure out what the other one is is, is going to do and, and how, you know, he'll be and, and trying to figure out special needs trust and living wills and different things so you have all that you're worrying about and then you're trying to figure out how are they going to navigate like life you know outside when it was already hard for them right now just as teenagers and and, and younger um like this world they're just going to look at them they're just, just going to see like black man and they already yeah. see that and i was just like and, and you know they don't because as their parent, you're like, you know they don't have the face of a man yeah. yet. Like, you'll see. Yeah, but not, like, but they don't. No. Just assume means they're grown. And they treat them like that. And I'm like, how do you prepare them? How do you prepare yourself mm-hmm. to prepare them? <laughs> you know? And That's the biggest thing, too. So it's a lot. It's a lot of different it's, uh, I'm feeling more fears. I I understand where you're coming from with that, and it's just hard. Like it, it's hard to like picture what their futures are going to be like, and that you know my biggest fear is that somebody's going to look at him and think he's a threat, and then like proceed to do something to him 
if I'm not around and he's an adult, you know? Well, kind of an adult because I feel like he's not, you know, to me, he's always going to be my baby, but not everybody sees him like that in society. So that, 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 you know, that, that's one of the biggest things. And as men of color, they already have one strike against them, right? But then now we're adding the extra layer that they have a disability and then limited communication too, you know? And then because of the fact that they're on the spectrum, at least Aiden, he doesn't always comply with orders. So like that, that scares the shit out of me because I don't know, you know, if somebody's going to take it a certain way and then they're going to put hands on him or something like that, which is, you know, like it's, it's like a dark topic to bring up, but like, it's a reality. Like, I feel like people should know what, what it's like for us as moms of children that have autism and that are men of color. Yeah. It, all the time. I'm always trying to top it. I was always trying to share that. And I'm always trying to get people to see that. And, and you get the, you get pushed back. Um, I don't care, but <laughs> you know, it, it's like, it, it, life's too short for me to be caring about people who don't have the range to understand my experiences. Like it's, yeah, it's really like not, <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, you have to share, you have to share. And there's a lot of, a lot of people, um, who can relate to what I, to what I share and what I say and, and, but they're afraid to, to talk. I'm not afraid to share it. And I'm just like, it's cool. I got you. I'm going to share it. So you're, you're ready. Like, I got everybody. So, yeah, you know. So you're ready to share. I got you. You know, it's cool. Uh, and I, I just, it's like, I don't, I don't think a lot of people within the community understand that. And you have to keep pushing that. And you have to keep sharing that. And you have to keep putting that in their face. So like this big old, like this big old unmasking push thing they're doing. It's very, um, I don't know that. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, like, like I can't, I can't do that. I don't know it. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I'm proud for them, you know, but I, I can't do that, you know. And 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 even for someone like Aiden, who never masks, mm-hmm. and then look at all the stuff that happens to him. Unmasking for us isn't safe, like, I, and you know, to see like so many, almost throw it in your face like like it's like uh if you don't do it it's bad like that's what happened last week i was just like you don't do know it's not safe to unmask i do know i'm not gonna live in hot environments too exactly you know and well then that's just you being short-sighted and abusive and we deserve to be free and i'm just sitting there like well you need to work with your bud buddies your brothers your cousins your parents help them <laughs> because then that will help me be free <laughs> more yeah. free you know, it's true you know i can't live like you do and I, I like you know that would be nice you know but we're not there so until we get there <laughs> you know i have to do what I have to do, and I and I'm and I'm waiting. One of the children that I have does not mask at all, and I don't even know if that's does not mask at all. And and, and and there's a lot of things that I was I have been taught how to do, like taught how to mask in certain situations. Either it was like deliberately taught to me because you know you have to have that talk. You know mm-hmm. you you're, you know. Um, I think pretty much all of us have had it at one point. So you know we're I mean? going this place and remember that you can't do this X, Y, Z. You know, I feel like as women of color, this happens to us a lot, right? Like we need to like blend in. So it's like they tell us the the proper way to behave so that we won't stand out and have caught attention called to us. But like I know as a person that's neurodiverse, it's there's another layer to that, you know, because right. um, but like you said, like mm-hmm, it's not easy. And then to be able to unmask, you have to be able to feel safe. And right now, the way that the climate is going, yes, it is quote unquote getting better, but it's still not there. So until then, we're gonna con- like people are gonna continue to mask. If you want your loved ones that are neurodiverse to unmask in front of you, then you need to create those safe spaces where they're not gonna feel judged. Where they're not going to be called out or told, hey, stop doing that. That's bothering me. Because the thing is, people, uh, neurodiverse people mask to accommodate neurotypicals. It's not for themselves. (laughs) It's to accommodate y'all. So 
Think about that next time you ask somebody to unmask, right? Right. Exactly. And it, it, it's not. It's not easy. It's not. It's not. Um, about eighty percent of the time, I'm in control of me. <laughs> right. Like I can do it. I can. But if I go for long periods of time where I am doing it and I haven't been able to not do it, yeah. then that increases the possibility of me have not control. having control and stuff. And, and it's just, it's a lot. And I, I, I just want, you want people to like understand that there is privilege in being able to unmask mm-hmm. and privilege in being able to turn it on and turn it off. And mm-hmm. turn it back on again, and turn it off, and when to know when to do it, yep. and when to know when to pull back, you know, and and what context and what situations and what circumstances do you mask, mm-hmm. like, and do you unmask? Because that can change moment to moment, like just that fast, boom, click, boom, you now you're masking or. Mm-hmm. You're code switching, or you're doing both, and you don't like so it's just like a lot of depth that approach and knowing how to do that. And um, a lot of people who talk about these these issues and trying to drill it into our, our head and try to teach us that, um, and try to treat us like we all experience um, disability same. in the same way, they don't, they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I'm just here trying to remind the people. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you're doing an amazing job. I really appreciate the work that you do, and that you're like, I feel like you're the mouthpiece a lot of the time for people that are neurodiverse, that are you know, for other people to see your side of of like the reasoning behind your thoughts and and your opinions about that. So I was gonna ask you. Tiffany, when did you find out that you were neurodiverse? And, like, how did that affect your parents? It was um, suspected when I was, like, 13, 14, something like that. Okay. And then, um, but I guess, you know, we didn't go any further with, like, testing or anything. This is, you know, mm-hmm. Asperger's sounded worse than anxiety. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, like, yeah. you know, walk away with a, a diagnosis of depression and severe anxiety um and then i diagnosed officially when i was 18 uh, and i was at college and freshman in college and um mm-hmm. i lost a pen and it was the most raggedy pen you could ever see I had a troll topper it was broken but mm-hmm. you know i had a it had a it fit my fingers really it was good. Your and I lost it and I had a test and I missed the test. A test that I knew I was gonna pass. Was, you know. But I missed it. And I fell down, missed it. Stay in all stay in my room for like two days or something. And I needed a note. And I was told it was easier to get into psych services for the note than it was to go to the university uh Yeah. Nurse. I ain't questioning. It didn't seem like it was easier, but whatever. <laughs> you know, you guess you go, but you go in and you have to say, "Hey, I'm having like an emergency mental thing." You know, and then they'll see you, you know, quicker so they can talk to you and oh, okay. and and uh, go through, you know, what you're going through. So I guess they feel like let's handle those situations fast before they, you know, want to hurt themselves. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just in there. I'm like, I just need this note, um, and that's why I tell them when I'm in there. I was like, I need the note. For class, so I can retake this test. And um, sitting there and talking to him for about fifteen minutes, and he's like, "Have you heard of Asperger's?" And I'm like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> you know? So it's just like, yeah, I heard of it, but I wasn't about to be sitting up in here for. I was like, then I like ask, you know, was this gonna give me the note? <laughs> you know? And so go through a few more testing, and they talk, and I talk to them more, and that's when he feels like. That diagnosis was appropriate, but he wanted to send me out to someone else, and so go out to For a second yeah, opinion. go out to them, get diagnosed, and yeah. But 
I'm, uh, I'm diagnosed since like 2003, right? So it's like internet is there, but it's not. Mm-hmm. It not like it is now. now. And Facebook was kind of like introduced like probably a couple a year or so later, um, and then it was mm-hmm. only for college students, yep. and it wasn't you know. So yeah, I'm still here. I had space and stuff, but it was just like I was like. Yeah. Right here, you know, it's just like you. There was no neurodivergent community. There was no neurodiversity movement. There was no mm-hmm. like, oh, my British autism. Blah. No, because I was diagnosed with Asperger's. I didn't know what autism was. Like that was that, right? And so it was just hide that. I didn't need that. Put that somewhere in the drawer. You know, mm-hmm. I have a family member who has a, a, a diagnosis of, of something that I, and I see how they treat him. And I don't want that. I don't want this. Hide that. Anyway, tuck it away. Don't think about it. And kind of just do what I've been doing my whole life, which was struggling, but finding a way to make that struggle seem like it wasn't that big. So I did very good. I was really good at compensating um, for, for mm-hmm. different things. Um, and, you know, Really, people that I got really, really close to me, they they noticed, <laughs> you know, like different things. That, but then I had kids. Well, I had Aiden, and then he was diagnosed, and then I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, you're like, oh crap, it came from me. But then like, there's there's um autistic people on my my um husband's side too, so it came from you. So. <laughs> yeah, I had a professor. I had a professor that said. This is, um, it was a behavior class when I was doing my master's to be a teacher. And he said that, uh, usually genetically it comes from the father's side of the family. But, you know, that's like, I feel like unless you do like a real genetic test, like you really don't know. But, um, he was like, yeah, usually when you meet the parents, cause he worked, he's a therapist and a behavior. No, he's a BCBA. So he was working in a group home and he's like, well, every time I met my, my, my students, parents, I would meet the dad and I'd be like, oh, this is, this is, this is where they get it from. Um, which I feel like my, my son's dad doesn't, I don't think, you know, but I, this is why we're going for the genetic testing now to see like for sure. You know, because another thing, I'm like, uh, they're like, oh, why do you have a little girl? Like, never. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I, like, I'm not a gambling person. I don't like playing Russian. Not that it's Russian roulette, but I don't like gambling, period. So, I'm good. <laughs> it is independent now. He can take care of himself. So, um, we're good. On that. <laughs> but when, when, so when, when they were diagnosed, because you had already had the experience, like, it was easy. Was it, did you find it was easier? To guide them and support them in that way, or, no, or how did you feel about that? Complete opposite. <laughs> because I lived a life where I didn't really face that stuff. And you didn't really like understand mm. what it was. So you knew you were different when you were young, um, and you knew you were bullied for it, and you knew that they 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 they, they, they honed in on those exact things that got you the diagnosis, and they picked at it and picked at it and picked at it, and you knew you had a, a very supportive grandma who taught you how to write to express yourself and, 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 and translate your thoughts and, and put that to paper, but you don't, mm-hmm. you know, think about it and you try to distance yourself from the diet or from, from being different. And then you get diagnosed, mm-hmm. try to distance yourself from that. And then your child's diagnosed and then you're like, okay, but you're still not thinking. <laughs> like, you're just kind of like, <laughs> okay i got this you know but you're you're not i'm not like making that like connection right so it's just like all about aiden you know just focus on aiden mm-hmm. and you're not really you know thinking about yourself you know and i'm not understanding any of the challenges that i have i know i'm struggling but i'm attributing it mm-hmm. to something else and, and to other things mm-hmm. and so i'm still not thinking about it and it wasn't until jojo was diagnosis that I started to think more about my diagnosis and, and how it's impacting me you know and how it influences my parenting be that in a good way or not so good way and then a few more years later after that that's when I'm, I'm starting to like okay I need to sit down I need to think <laughs> I need to figure out what it is that I'm doing because I'm like 
floundering here. Like, you know, and I, and when I did get onto social media to vent and share and stuff, I did not reveal my my autism diagnosis when I first joined. I wanted to just be parent mm-hmm. and then this and this. And then I realized that it was more than just parent and it didn't fit in the parent groups. And it was like I was having a split in my in my mind. Like it was just going in different places and, mm-hmm. and I didn't understand. I couldn't relate. And then in, in real life, and I'm trying to like come to terms with my own diagnosis and figure out what that means for me. And um, yeah. but yeah, it wasn't, I didn't fully, I don't want to say fully, but like embrace that diagnosis until it was probably like four years ago, maybe or so. Like it's okay. probably, yeah, it's probably about four years. Ish. And I'm still just kind of playing it day by day. Winging it. <laughs> I think it helps. In a lot of ways it does, yeah. it does help. Um, uh, the diagnosis does help. Um, it does inform my parenting in a way that I feel like it wouldn't have if I didn't have this diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And then other times it's just me trying to figure out how to help them without it triggering me at the same time. So it's just kind of like trying to, trying to find a balance and trying to help them along their their journeys and in their lives and and yeah but it's um something that i'm just trying to sort through and 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 figure out and and as a person who's been well you live with autism your whole life but as a person who's been aware of it Mm -hmm. (laughs) for almost so many years it's Mm -hmm. me just trying to go through and figure it out and that's part of the main reason why I don't I don't share autism academically and I don't tell you what a red flag is and I don't tell you what a symptom is and I don't tell you. None of that is not mm-hmm. my my thing. It always kind of, I don't want to say it weirds me out, but it's like someone who was like diagnosed last year and now they're like the leading authority on autism. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't get it and I couldn't do it. I like, it's just like, because we're all different and we're all, and I couldn't talk about autism in a general way and and mm-hmm. I didn't want to explain it in a general way when it was an individual experience for me so I feel like there's a lot of stuff that mm-hmm. we can talk about and we can relate to and, and things like that but I didn't want to run the risk of if I did go down that road and share about autism in like a more academic way I didn't want to make it to run the risk of it generalizing to like everyone else so i just like avoid it and then like ride the lane that i'm doing okay in. and i figure out i'm like i'm at the point where i'm like by the time you find me on the internet <laughs> i'm assuming <laughs> that you know what autism is at this point you know when you <laughs> have a strong grasp of it you might not know everything but you, you got a good grip on it or you're following somebody yeah. else who is doing that for you. Is telling you what yeah. misophonia is, or or what sensory challenges are, and all this that stuff. I feel like you can get that from somebody else. By the time you come to me, I just assume you know it, and then <laughs> so I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about other things that that affect us as um, disabled people and disabled families and stuff. So I'm like, that's a good lane for me to ride. <laughs> I'm gonna ride that lane. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I was gonna tell you, Tiffany. I love your writing style. Like all your posts that you just like go on and like talk about your experience, your writing style. Shout out to Grandma, by the way, because we didn't give her a shout out. Shout out to your grandma for teaching you all this stuff. Because your writing style is like <laughs> chef kiss. Yeah. I love the way you express yourself, and it just kind of flows, and it really like at least for me, it reaches me in like a a deeper level, not just like surface level. Like, you know, when you read something, somebody's experience, you're like, yeah, whatever. But it, it like the way you write really makes me see your perspective and kind of understand where you're coming from with the opinions that you have um, regarding the different things. So I was going to ask you, I know 
sort of the inspiration, but I wanted you to share with the listeners, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Um, Simon and Schuster editor, honestly, not even gonna lie. <laughs> so it was, um, <laughs> I always knew I wanted to write a book. I did not know that my first book was going to be a children's book. I thought that if I did do a children's book, which I did plan on doing, that it would be like third or fourth book, right? <laughs> like, like mm-hmm. um, but I wanted to write, I knew I wanted to write a book. And one day I just shared about our families. Um, we call them no talk days. So we just don't talk and we just kind of like, you know, interact with each other um, using uh, AAC devices and stuff. And it's not, yeah, because oh, we okay, wanted okay. to, um, it was inspired by JoJo. He just said one day, you know, how about we just talk like Aiden talks? And I said, hmm, okay. And so when we do it, it's like you're modeling, so you're showing him as well, and you're doing it through each other, and he's seeing that, like, all the time. And then mm-hmm. I shared about it, because we did enough of those days that I had enough experience with it that I felt it was strong enough to write about it. And so I wrote about it. I didn't know anybody was going to read it, because it, was, it wasn't really, like, a super story, and then it was kind of long, so it was just me kind of, like, explaining what this is, what we learned, um, how difficult it is. Um, and the purpose behind them and how I felt like the world would be a better place if more people did it. And that post just kind of took off somewhere and where it just woo, flew. It, everybody liked it. <laughs> and then an editor from Simon and Schuster reached out and said and wanted to meet with me to talk about doing a children's book. And I'm like, really? Okay, cool. And that was the book that they pitched. It was like, can you, can you write a book around this, around this post? And I was like, nope. <laughs> like, I didn't know how, right? I was just like, <laughs> like, okay, I'll give it a try. Um, so it was like a few back and forth emails that fell through. But I had that book already in my head now. So it's in my head. And I'm like, uh-huh. hmm, I might could do this. So I'm rewriting it, I'm tweaking it, I'm like, then I kind of stopped, and I'm like, rewrote it again, I'm like, I think this is kind of cool, and I talked to some friends that already had, like, book deals and stuff, I'm like, can you just pass this to your publisher, you know, like, you know, I don't know if they actually (laughs) did or not, but I'm just like, okay, and then I started to get, like, a little bit, like, discouraged, because you're sending it out to, like, all these people, all these, you're sending it to agents, you're sending it to, to, to everyone, you sending it to publishing houses, mm-hmm. um, and then I was like, I'll just publish it myself. But then at the same time, I realized that the bulk of the people that I saw getting deals were on were were, were social media presences, presences, presences. <laughs> so, and I was uh, like, okay, they're online. You can't find one publisher that doesn't have an Instagram account or an agent or a or a Twitter or a what. I'm like, they're online. They're plucking True. people. Yeah offline and I said I need to switch how I'm writing so if I have to self-publish this book I will but I need to switch how my my thing is so sometime after that that's when I started to share more even more stories even more poetry even Mm -hmm. more things like that was more like emotional stuff I'm trying to snag some attention (laughs) <laughs> like, see me. <laughs> I yeah, using yeah. like hashtags for like publishers and stuff that they would be going and looking and reading and I'm like, okay, somebody's gonna see. Me. But then I was like, okay, I'm gonna try and self publish this book. And I finished writing it. I showed my husband and he was like, It's cool. But he's always gonna say that. So he's not a very good critic. And uh <laughs> he's a good yeah, like, gosh. <laughs> so you're like I love everything you do, girl. Yes. I'm like, come on. But I, I, when I asked if I can have, um, if I can get an artist, I said, I put a post up and I said, can I, um, does anybody illustrate? I'm looking for an illustrator. And I got like so many responses for that. Like I lost track. Oh my God. This illustrate. The people that are not watching the, you good. Okay. The people that are just listening and not watching the YouTube video, you need to go on YouTube and look at the framed um, cover art that she has behind her. Oh, it is the most beautiful 
picture. <laughs> like his his artistic style. Oh wait, is it? Oh, it's a woman. That, yeah, that, Kate. That oh, oh, okay. Her artistic style is chef's kiss. Also, so it's like the combination of the words and the picture. Yo. Is just beautiful. Just she like so knocked beautiful. it out of the park, right? It was like, look. I'm trying to flip it around. I don't know if you can see it. Oh my god. Yes. Oh, uh, freaking amazing. But the, it was like the time that I went and I was like asking for illustrators. That's when um, Rebecca, who, who runs the um, publishing house, that's when she reached out and said, hey, I want to talk to you about something. And so met with her. She wanted to talk about doing a kid's book and I was like, I got one. And I told her about it, what I liked, what about it. And then I was, she was like, you know, sign the contract. And then I'm sitting here thinking, oh crap, what did I do? I don't really have a book, <laughs> right? But <laughs> I wrote it, but I'm like, I didn't think it was like good. <laughs> so then I rewrote it. Stop it. And so that's the, the, okay. the last, that's what this book is now. Boom, the, the final, final one. Copy. And then you're yeah. sitting around and you're waiting for an illustrator and... She gave me a, a selection of 10 to choose from, and then they you can look at their art. Mm-hmm. And the illustrator I have, Kate, I did not choose. <laughs> right? I'm like, I like, so when they told, I told two people, I think. And mm-hmm. when they told me that it was going to be Kate, I was like so worried because I was like, I don't know what it's going to look like. Like, you have all this, you feel like you don't have as much control when you go, like, a traditional publisher, right? You're just like, what's going mm-hmm. on? What's going to look like? It's just a waiting yeah. game. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And then the first pieces came out. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then, like, <laughs> they did amazing. And we didn't even interact, like, talk or speak with each other or... She just read the book and then she came up yeah. with the and, and, and that. Well, and then I sent pictures of, you know, Aiden and his device and, and uh, Rebecca acted as the middle person. So, like, I would say, hey, um, can Aiden have glasses because he wears glasses? And then she she would tell Kate and then Kate would do the glasses and then Kate would come back to me and say, hey, can you send me a picture of his board? Um, what his board looks like. Yeah, on, um, on his um, on his iPad. And so we send, I okay, send okay. that, and then you know. So that's how we like communicated back and forth, and then we finally talked directly to each other. Like after the book was like drawn up, and we were just waiting for it to like be all like put together and printed and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and things like that. But I'm like, me, it was so amazing. Like, the art is so amazing, and it complements the words like so well. And I'm just like, I think a lot of people love it. Oh, oh. So. But I think so. <laughs> okay. So before I go to my next question, can you read like your favorite, uh, I guess, a little extra uh, from the book? Let's say, I'm gonna have, well, there's a lot. It's a sleeve on it. I'm going to take the sleeve off because I mess it up every time I do. I already got greasy fingers on it. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> there's a lot of favorite pages. Let me see. Um, pick, your, pick the one that, that you feel like today is like, I like this one. All right. I guess I'll start um, so, oh, I thought I took so, so this one, I don't know if you can see it. So that page right there. And it says, oh wait, I'll describe it. I, I'll describe the photo to them. Um, so the illustration is a mom embracing her son and, uh, she is speaking or breathing, uh, a toy boat, a toy tugboat into the air. Right? Yeah. Good. Or like water i think she's more like singing but we'll see oh, okay maybe sing. so um it says like water mama's voice dances around bobbing up and down as it leaves her throat much like the waves that carry a boat so he's like describing oh, her voice and how it sounds and other than- oh my god i love the dad too oh, i love this book i'm gonna get like 10 copies <laughs> yeah. So he's, you know, sitting on dad's lap and dad is, um, his voice is, that was one of the main things I liked about, I loved about what Kate did is she drew the voices coming out. 
like sub voices and she yeah. and I'll show you, I'll show you the other pages with the device but she made it a point to let you know that something was coming from them in some way whether it was the um, tablet or yeah. they were speaking it or and I thought that was like super awesome but this page here so he's sitting in his dad's lap um and then on the opposite page there's a boat that looks like it's sinking and it says daddy's voice is like air soft as a light summer breeze that kisses my cheek strong as the winds of hurricanes that abandon ships at sea so i was just basically like describing the beauty of dad's voices right it's just like they can be so freaking loud like just so booming but yeah. then they can also have like this calming like Effect and make you feel yeah. like you're like and at ease softness. and stuff. So I was like, yeah. I gotta try and include that. This was one of the first pages that yeah, I saw I that, that, like, I was like, and like cried because it was like, so here's a little one. And he's standing and he looks so small compared to all the big yeah. people and all the voices like just around him. And he's holding his little iPad. And this is Aiden's exact iPad. The same case, same everything. The same phone <laughs> yeah. and everything. That's awesome. Oh, and then the and then the big people are speaking, but there's word bubbles. Oh yeah, coming word out bubbles and, and coming out, and they're walking well. around, and it's it's all it's just like a busy scene, and he's just standing there looking so yes. little. And um, it says, "All these people around me, diverse and unique. I hear them all, but they do not hear me." And so he's saying, "I do not speak." Oh, and so he's yeah. just like standing there, like I was like, oh, I was like ugly crying, and then um, I, was, I like this one. So like when like I was saying, she has everything coming off, so it's like oh my god, I love it's coming that. off. So this one is like his iPad, and it has different pictures of um animals. So like bird, turtle, ooh, that's a rat. Yeah. I'm looking at it upside down. Rabbit. Yeah, it's a rabbit. It's a bunny. And I, I want to say it's a fish, but his fingers are behind it. <laughs> or it's behind his fingers. Okay. And the bird is just floating up off the page. Flying off the page. And <laughs> I was born like this. No voice from my lips. I am autistic. I use a tablet to be heard. Pushing buttons with pictures that speak my words. And so he's... He's leaning over and getting his little... His little, uh, read on. But it was just like... Such a great book. Such a great book. I love your book. I'm like obsessed. So, Comadres, in the show notes, I will put a link so that you guys can pre-order Tiffany's book. And um, make sure it's going to, you guys are going to forget that you ordered it. And then I'll oh, show me. It's going to be like, <laughs> present. Hi. What's up? Okay. So, I know you are a busy woman. You have two young men that require your attention. Plus a husband. And you have a career, and you're a writer. So, tell me what does self care look like for you? Like, how do you pour back into Tiffany to get yourself, you know, back to your center? Um, I take a lot of drives. I travel a lot. I like. I don't like to sit in one place. I need stuff to look mm, forward okay. to. I can't always afford stuff, but I try and do it. It's just like I think that yeah. that started up about. A little bit after um, I got COVID in 2020. Like, it was, like, the first year COVID was, like, bad. And I got COVID. And yeah. it was, like, before they had the vaccine. And then they were telling you all in the news, you know, it, it hurts. It hurts black and brown people the worst, the most. And if you got under, like, a slope, you're just like, dang, I'm all of this. You know? And, like, you got, like. I, <laughs> you're like, I got yeah, all of and, this. And you <laughs> just it, it sent me into, like, a. Like a it was bad. Um, and then it's also around the time that um, I found the cyst in my head. And I just, yeah, I was doing therapy and she was telling me, you know, your your mind can't hold the negative thought and the positive one at the same time. So don't give the, the negative mm. one life. Like Think of the positive ones. And like, so she would like distract me with something. Like she would be like, hey, I like, like she would say, hey, I like that picture on the back of your wall. What's going on there? Like after I was just sitting there. And finished discussing with her something that like, like sucked that I was ruminating on, and then she would go like, "Yeah, yeah, oh, I love that picture back there. Like, who drew it? Is that your book? Is it?" And then I would sit there and I'm talking about my book now, and I don't feel 
you know, sad. Um, so yeah. I drive a lot and I I started to travel more. Um we were already getting into traveling before COVID came. But now it's mm-hmm. just now it's just like a thing I do and I look forward to doing it, whether it's small road trips, whether it's I just need to get out of the house, stretch my legs. I need to just listen to music. I need to just, for some reason, I don't know what yeah. it is, but music just sounds different in the car. Yes. I don't know, it's like it just does, and I just need to be out there, like just have, you know, and... and Listen, I think there's like a thing, um, musicians, when they want to listen, or like rappers also, when they want to listen to how a beat is going to sound, they go and sit in a car, because I think the acoustics in the car gives you that true sound of what you're actually hearing. Yeah. When you hear it in your house, you have a bunch of, like, surfaces that absorb the sound. And then sometimes it bounces off in a weird way. So the sound, the music doesn't sound the same. But but for sure, but for sure, in the car, it sounds way better. Way video. better. I was like, that's what, I, so I just, that's my, that's my care right now is, is that. And then I have, like, a little... I was going to say money jar, but it's not really a jar. It's just like a little account that I like just put little monies into um, when I can. Rainy day money. Yeah, and Rainy I just save money. it for like um, those little like weekend drives or daily drives and stuff. So like I have the stuff where I'm like, I want, I'm going, I want to go to DC in July. So yeah, you have a big pot you save for, but then there's like other things, like little things I want to do. Yeah. And that helps me um, just get out and and have something to do and have something to look forward to my boys love rides and it's just yeah something that we do you know we we load up on snacks and we just get in the car and we just kind of we kind of go and you just don't think about anything no riding and no there's something relaxing about that yeah i love it that's how you know that's how i i like I'm, i'm i'm a single mom and i'm dating so that's how I feel is whether or not I can vibe with somebody. Because like, if we can just drive for long distances without talking and then we both feel comfortable and like the other person doesn't feel like they need to like Say fill the void yeah. with extraneous <laughs> words, then I'm like, you're my person. Yay. Yes. It's like the greatest <laughs> thing. And then sometimes I try to get my, my husband to drive too because I'm like, I'm like, I want to be a passenger princess. I know, <laughs> right? It's so funny. <laughs> You're like, I want to put my my feet. I want to take off my shoes. Yeah. I I mean, he's over there all comfortable. He's like, I'm okay being a passenger prince. You know, so I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) like, you know, so it's just like, it's just, I get out and and I ride and we go and we see things and we, um, uh, we were, at one point we were looking for ghost towns around here. I think we found like, a few. Um, and so now I think we might change it to like just finding the historical markers around here and then nice. going to go do that and look at those. And then, Wait, what state are you guys uh, in? I Texas. Oh, Texas. Uh, we're in West Texas now in a uh, okay. tiny, 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 tiny town. <laughs> like, like, it's just like, like, it's, like on the ra- on the racist, <laughs> how racist? <laughs> like if there's if it's a, if it's a ten, this is like a like it's, it's, it's like it's like an eight. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's bad. Because I love Texas. Like, let me tell you, I look at those houses. Like, I follow this real estate agent over there, and the houses are enormous. I'm like, I would love to live. Oh, there's some big ones. But then I think about the people that are living there. I'm like, oh Lord Jesus. Yeah, you gotta do the right spot. <laughs> And we are not in the right spot, and I and I'm Girl. ready to. I, I need to go. I know I shared. I shared. I'm yeah, like I need to pack it up. I shared my Substack that I'm like I don't have like a place or like a home, and I I don't we don't have we move so much because my husband's job. I like I was like yeah. this has to be the year where I have to like park. I need a house. I want a house. I'm just like so that's what we're like looking at and working for is and seeing because I am ready to just like put roots down somewhere, and I'm tired of moving. Especially out here, yeah, my West dream, Texas, yeah, where the scale is at. My dream is, is so, <laughs> girl. My dream is to own a little a, a house and then have a little garden where I'm be you know tending to my plants because I already have a bunch of plants here in the apartment. But it's like I live in a two bedroom in New York City. You know, I mean, even though my apartment is one of those um 
pre-war ones that they're like pretty big but still like it's like i need space i want a yard i want to be able to go like ground in the backyard take off my shoes and walk around barefoot like I don't have that here. Yes, that's what I want. I want right now. We're in a, a townhouse, and you know you have the neighbors on the east side. I just, I just, I don't like it. And it was the only place that we could get where it was like month to month because my husband moves okay. a lot, and um, we yeah. move a lot. So I was like, we could not commit to like the the uh, full like, like a like yeah, a lease. We have to do month to month because they'll snatch him up and send him somewhere quick, and. But I can't breaking the lease it. is not affordable. It's not. It's just like it's not, hey, y'all gotta let people out. Try to stay up here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, let people leave. Be like I cannot stay yeah. here. My mental health. Exactly. That's what I feel like here too. And the walls are so thin and you just hear everybody and everything. Mm-hmm. And the yard's not big enough. We got a dog. And um, what kind of dog do you guys have? He's a border collie mix. The longer you stare at him, okay. he kind of looks like an Australian Shepherd, though. So I don't know. I was gonna do one of them doggy DNAs on him. <laughs> but I need. It. I want to know for sure. It's like I just need to know for sure. <laughs> like, You're like I need. Yeah, to know. because they said he's a color that is rare in border collies, but they they are in. They do come in the color he is. He's like a red orange like a reddish orange color okay he's like a ginger yeah and he has these really like white brownish gold eyes or something like these like brownish gold eyes Mm -hmm. and stuff but oh he wild he's so wild (laughs) we read about it i just got eight in a dog i just got eight in a dog too he's a labradoodle he's also like a rare color because they're they're not supposed to be black he's like jet black with like maybe a little bit of salt and pepper here and there, but he's so freaking cute. I'm like, I can't deal. But he's so bad. He's like nine months. He's like chewing on everything. You know how they do. I'm like, oh my. But Aiden is obsessed with him. He's like, hi there, little puppy. Like he'll <laughs> randomly like compliment him. He's like, oh look at the hair. Oh, I like your haircut, Drogon. I'm like, I love you so much. That's so cute. Aiden pretty much ignores our dog. Um. <laughs> you know he's there, but uh, in his defense, this dog is too extra. He's just—he's—he does the most, right? But Aiden's chill. Exactly. You were telling me, so yeah, I can't. Yeah, the cat, I can't, like, so the cat, the cat act like Aiden. So is his people. And so they, <laughs> she, she too much too. She a diva. She always got to sit on stuff and be everywhere. And I'm just like, who? <laughs> you ain't got to be everywhere I am, and there she is, right? Right there. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> tell me you're a pet parent without telling me you're a pet parent. You're in the bathroom. You can't use the bathroom by yourself ever again because they're always right there. there. And then, like, I, the worst thing I could have done was buy that. JoJo wanted a collar for, for the cat. Her name is Pretzel. And I don't know what made me do this, but I just was tired of him asking me. So I just went into the store and grabbed the collar. I didn't think anything. I grabbed the collar. With the, with the little. Oh my god, it has a bell. <laughs> That's all I hear. That's all I hear all night. It's a bell, and I'm like, I can't do this. It's like ding a ding And there's stairs. There's stairs. JoJo's bed is up. Oh bedroom is God. upstairs, and she's always where JoJo is. So it's just like, really, <gasps> like up and down the stairs, and I'm just like, I can't hear this bell. No, but I want to take the bell off, but yeah, I'll leave you. I can't, oh I'm not God. doing it again. I'm not, I can't, I just. <laughs> You're like, never again. It's just all you hear is this bell. And I'm like, well, do you have sleep? And she does sleep. She sleeps a lot, but she doesn't sleep when it counts. <laughs> like, she's like, yeah, right. You're like. You're like, aren't you ready for a nap yet? Yeah, she's like, no, thank no. you, mom. She's like, everywhere. <laughs> she's awesome, though, but she everywhere. I can't do it. <laughs> Oh my god, Tiffany, this conversation was so good. I'm going to end the show how I usually end it, which is follow me at Comadre on the Pod. And you can follow Tiffany on IG at, please drop your handle. Fidgets and fries. Oh, there's a dot between fidgets. So it's fidgets dot and dot fries. Perfect. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a Comadregram via email at marcy at comadrandopod.com or slide up into my DMs. 
Uh, please visit our website, www.comaranopod.com, to read our latest blog posts, to find out about future events, and get your official Comariando merch. And I want to welcome you to be an official Comadre, Tiffany. So now you're a Comadre. Yay! And I want to thank everyone for spending time with your Comadres. Have a good night. Bye. Do you have a minute for Comadre time?